Artworks Gallery and Theatre. My name is Javier Hernandez Villanes. It's a beautiful day. It's going to get more beautiful. I'm going to present you with the curator of the, the exhibition, Jason Mamarella. About 10 months ago, Jason came to me with his vision, and now we're all here to share it. Thank you, Jason. So, Jason, come and say a few things and introduce the panel. And there were still Levant posters up from like 20 years earlier. And yeah, we had a discussion of who was that, because all the new kids, nobody really knew who that was, because it was so much before. A lot of people, for some reason, think street art started for some reason in like the late 90s. But um, I guess that's what this panel's about. We're going to talk about that a little bit. So that's basically the show. And uh, I reached out to Chris, and I like Chris a lot. We got along very well. Um, probably very interesting. Thank you. Hey, uh, okay, I'm Carlo, I'm the, uh, the fortunate and honored one who gets to hang out with these grizzly veterans of the New York States, and it, it, uh, they all have long histories, and I could pontificate forever about them, but it would be really boring, so uh, I think it's more interesting to hear them talk for themselves, so I thought what I might do would be probably start with a kind of generic easy question for everyone, which would be a way to explain who they are, but let me at least uh, see if I can remember everyone's name with, with all the hot ass smoke. So uh, we, we start on, the, I'm going to go from the far end closer to me. Uh, this is uh, Linus Caraggio, who is a sculptor, and so he kind of brings a 3D element to this conversation, and Linus is one of the kind of founding members of the Rivington School. So they did like a great sculpture park, like right along uh, Eleanor Roosevelt Park on the Lower East Side and the gas station and stuff. Uh, Anthony Hayden Guest, who is a, a writer, far greater renown than I am, uh, and has been a, a, a really stalwart supporter of, of this culture for a long time, so we're happy to have his wisdom here. Uh, Lauren Monk, who uh, also goes by another name, and he's kind of more famous for it because he does something on the internet, but I don't go there very much, but Lauren's been kind of uh, uh, using the city as a, a muse and a taxonomy for his work for a long time, and uh, not only done work about the city, but done work on the city. So uh, that's uh, really good. Uh, David Freed is one of the founding members of Avant and was a, a kind of fixture of New York for many years, but we lost him uh, sometime uh, in the last century uh, to Dusseldorf, was it? Yeah, and so, and he's a really great sculptor, uh, and, uh, and his work's in the show as well, and we'll talk about it. This is Al Diaz, as close as we have to a living legend here, and uh, Al's been uh, uh, started as a graffiti artist, uh, is well known for his collaborations with Jean-Michel under the name Samo, and uh, is still kicking it with some of the uh, funniest wordplay out there. And then Christopher Chambers here, uh, you've got a middle name in there, right, Hart? Yeah. So it's like, he does the thing like that they have to do for serial killers, where you have to get all their names and then confuse them with another Chris Chambers. I know him as Chris, but... Uh, uh, a lot of his work is here, and he was the uh, the engine, the motor, and the gasoline for Avant, which uh, is celebrated in this show. I hope you don't mind my stinginess and brevity on that, but I think if I went on longer, it would be really boring. So I thought what we might do, this is kind of a way, like think of it as like speed dating, way to introduce yourself to the audience, would be for each of you to talk about when you first recognized uh, kind of expressions on the street and understood the, 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 about this urban canvas and, and so what inspired you to, to kind of work in this uncommissioned way in public place and then uh, how you started doing that. So this is kind of a little prehistory. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, cool. Why don't we, uh, for easiness, let's start passing it, uh, the mic down. We'll start with Chris here. Uh, Samo was uh, an enormous 
phenomenon in New York City um, as one of the, the hoodlums growing up on, in this town. And uh, it, it kind of represented the, the fulcrum between when graffiti was, well, it started, it's got a, obviously a very, very long history, but uh, there was a, in the 70s, there was, uh, it became a, a what, what's that word when you use a, a calligraphic thing with monikers and uh, nicknames. And Albert here uh, invented a sort of a form of like an American haiku, which, if, if you're okay with that. Um, and, and then uh, I saw this and said, that is very cool. But I am a visual artist, a visual artist. And um, I kind of took that and just started putting up art as art, not as nicknames or, or graph per se, in the street of uh, just straight up art. And just for timeline, was that with Avant in 1980? Were you doing the before? I started doing a few of them, but then I, I don't want to take everybody's time up, but I, then I called up a, a bunch of friends and, and uh, a guy who was writing Avant as his graffiti name, and it, it was kind of a, a goof. Uh, he wrote T-A-G, which is a goof on tag. Tagging was writing graffiti. I used to write in the trains when I was 12. So see, he wrote T-A-G, which was also meant the avant-garde. So it was kind of a goof. And it was an imaginary, a fictitious gag. But then it became a real gang. In fact, Caleb here was part of it. But then he decided to be an architect instead, and you gotta let the guy go. <laughs> so, um, are we talking about our first introduction to yeah, public you, illicit? Because you were, you were I was a kid. Right? I was I, I started I started writing graffiti first generation when I was 12, 1971. Uh, the reason I did it or was attracted to it was because it was a very, it seemed like it was kind of a secret organization. And it was, um, I, I first discovered graffiti up in Washington Heights, which is arguably the spawning ground for Tech. what has become, yeah, Tech in 183. Um, the, the spawning ground for, for what has become a global phenomenon, uh, an organized global phenomenon. And it was an attractive thing because it was, it was the, the, the players were, were, they had a certain style, a certain, you know, Player, and I, I, I'm 12 years old looking for an identity, and I, I, could, I, I said, I want to do that. I want to write my name on walls and, and, and be cool like that. Because there, there was, in the Lower East Side where I grew up, there was, nobody was doing that. But up in Washington Heights, I had a cousin who lived up there, and I saw this, and it was totally different. Did you know Lee from the Lower East Side at that time? Later. He came in later. Later, he was kind of late in the game in terms of, like, I mean, this is 71. Lee started writing around 74, 75, which for a young person, a, a teenage, first of all, graffiti culture was, was hatched by, the average uh, player was between 9 and 14. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we were, it was a very young culture, it was kids, this is, and we, you know, we made this happen. Speaking of the neighborhood, uh, uh, the first one I remember was Grant's Tomb was the first one to kind of get become such a sight of that shit. That Grant's Tomb. Tomb. It's, it's Soldiers and Sailors Monument, but they, everyone called it Grant's Tomb, even though it's not really Grant's Tomb. So, yeah, but, but it's, no, it's, yeah, that was a, a, a misnomer. It's, people had, somehow, it, it, it accidentally became Grant's Tomb. But that's what we already said. It was, yeah, and then it was Writer's Corner on 188th Street in Audubon. That was, people would come from all over the city to write here. It was like a, you know, it was a, it was a very, it was a sport-like activity. It was kind of like, you know, I want, you know, I want to have people to know my name. Right. It was very male-oriented, with like a big pit pissing contest. It wasn't about so much about create, being creative. We were, you know, it was like, you know, who's the fastest, who's got the most. And then they style and all that stuff kind of evolved later into the game. But at first, it was very much, you know, a sport. It's, you know, a, a delinquent sport, but a creative <laughs> delinquent sport. And that was attractive. Well, back to the question of 
you know, how do you make the jump from being a creative or somebody who's just got a lot to say, be expressive, to make that jump from you know doodling in your in your parents' place and and all to get out on the street? And well, I think a lot of it has to do with the influences that came before us, and that was of course the writers. And and if you had any access to history, you saw the writing on the wall for you know ancient times. And the thing was. If you're a creative person, and I know Chris and I, at least, you're talking about incubation from 9 to, to 14. I started painting, you know, on, on, on paper bags that my mother would bring home. You know, and, you know, and then like, I got my first ream of typing paper and could go on. And, you know, eventually you're just, you're just bursting with all this energy. And then you see what these people have been doing before you. And, you know, once you make that leap, um, I probably would not have done it on my own. Uh, I certainly wouldn't have done it on my own, were it not for Chris Chambers, because Christopher Hart Chambers, because <laughs> he had, you know, he had this vision. He saw something that was, it was like a niche that begged to be filled. And and the other side of it was that as I was growing up, and I had got my, you know, uh, uh, what is all that you got? Self-talk art. Uh, I'm going to do that. Yeah, there, there is no English word. Okay. okay. That is it. <laughs> All right. So, so I got in my chops and I met Salah Dali when I was a kid. And, I, you know, I, I met all these crazy people, but they were all influences on me. It was always about influence. You think you're creative, you're expressive, but you need these people to, to be turned on by, right? So Chris was one of them. The writers were another of them. And then there was the turn off on the other side, in my case, which was the banal advertisements on the street. I grew up listening to commercial free radio on, on WKCR and BAI and, and on and on. I hated commercials. And I hated cars, too, because I got run over a lot. And so the, the landscape for me was just void of anything really important. And I, you know, as a painter, already as a painter, Chris made that invitation, and, and what he did was, in a lot of ways, very clever and very, very honest. He never, like, dictated. You know, he was always, like, the guy said, I love you, I love your work. You're in, you're in, you're in. And it's like Charles Mingus would compose and then give, instead of notes to his musicians, he said, I give you, you know, you're the note, and you do what you have to do. And so we were able to flourish in those four years that we were together, and for me it was a great experience because, especially for me as a painter, you got to do warm-ups. The paintings were like, if you did 100 a week, if you were good, if you did, they were the warm-ups for your big paintings, so you don't come in cold after a day of, you know, washing dishes or whatever it is, and then mess up your canvas that, that you want to have some continuity with. So Chris gave me that opportunity, and that's, Honestly, I can say I would not have gone there without. Well, I'm uh, probably the one person on this panel that was not a New York native or uh, <clears throat> spent time here growing up. Um, I came from Idaho, and uh, they don't really have any art communities out there. I spent uh, three years in the Army in the early 70s, and I had a chance to visit places like Paris and Munich and Berlin and uh, Madrid and study art. And uh, I had a very, I guess what you would say, classical idea of art. <clears throat> and uh, at some point, my dad died. I inherited some money, and the first thing I said was, I got to get the hell out of Idaho. I got to go to where they have a real art world, and I came to New York. Of course, I didn't know anything about the culture. I didn't know anything about downtown, uptown, this place, that place. So I was just basically like a little, a little naive barbarian running around looking at things. And we were talking about the first thing you noticed, the first time you noticed something that was on the street. I think maybe the first thing I noticed when I got to town was I was in the subway, and I'm looking at one of the columns, and somebody had gone in and scratched in, you guys probably remember this, pray. Oh, yeah. Pray. 
And I'm th I look at them and go, well, that's interesting. And then two weeks later, I'm on a Coney Island or something, and I look in the call, and I see somebody scratched in prey. And I suddenly, at that point, I started going, wow, somebody is really out there doing a lot of work. And I, as I started to look at it, I saw this prey scratched into columns in the subway all over the place. OK, so that sort of turned me into someone that was going to look and try to be a little more adaptive and responsive to what was going on. And at that point, I started wandering around and trying to be more receptive and understand what was going on. This is how culture is made. It's not stuff that is formulated in the academy, and it's not stuff that is, uh, is put together by galleries that need to make money and, and sell stuff. This is about what these guys are talking about. Having this energy and trying to express it somehow. Anyway, so I'm running around, and uh, I was going to school at the Art Students League on the GI Bill, and I started going down to places like Soho, and this was actually before the East Village started to take off, but I was working in a place called Utrecht, selling art supplies, and uh, every day on my lunch hour, I would, it's actually a half an hour if I was lucky, I would, <laughs> I would run out, I would grab a sandwich at the Blimpies, sometimes I'd see Allen Ginsberg in there eating, and I would run up and down uh, East 10th Street and some of the other neighborhoods or streets around there, and I started paying attention to what was going on and making notes and going to openings. I was in the, in the store working one day, a lady walked in, beautiful, glamorous, blonde lady, walked in, she had this little kid with her, and she goes, oh, gee, can you show this guy how to stretch a canvas? I said, sure, this is, you know, take him in the back. This is what I did, we stretched the canvas. Had, they brought in some graffiti, and uh, I stretched it up, and she goes, oh, that's really good, you, you should come down, we open a new gallery, it's kind of fun. Uh, yeah, my name's Patty Astor, and uh, you know, so uh, come by. And we'll, you know. <laughs> Little did I know, I would be helping a lot of other people learn how to stretch canvases, prime canvases, do the kinds of things that I knew how to do. Um, anyway, I just uh, started paying attention to stuff. Then I bumped into the Avant guys, and I thought to myself, uh, this is interesting. This is a lot of fun. I like what they're doing. And as I said, I'd been in Europe, so I'd seen how. <coughs> other kinds of art movements that sort of developed out of things, and I've been studying art history. So at that point I said, uh, I should be helping these guys out because that's the way culture grows. Um, I was working with a dealer named Gabrielle Breyers, who was a paramour of Leo Castelli. Uh, she'd opened her own gallery at the time. And um, one of the things I did was I tried to take her out and show her around. As a matter of fact, I remember taking her out, we were running down, maybe it was Rivington Street, and I remember Carlo, if you can imagine this, he was like a young guy, red hair, and he was, he was actually hanging an exhibition of postcards, and he's, you know, and it's like maybe late in the summer, and he's running up and down, and he's, you know, sticking stuff up on the walls, and he's sweating, and I'm taking Gabrielle, and then what? This is what you have to pay attention to, because this is new stuff that's happening. And uh, anyway, uh, I actually arranged for Avant to have their first show at a you know serious Soho gallery. And, uh, and then I, uh, yeah, so uh, that's kind of where I'm at. And since then, I've kind of decided that uh, art history is a very important uh, thing for me. And so a lot of my art is based on. Uh, on art history and kind of following these things and see how they develop and uh, where they come from. Hi. Uh, Hello. You understand um, how the question applies to you, right? Because for people like us, it says writers and stuff. You can ask me a question? No, I just wanted to make sure you understood the question answer. You'll do fine. I don't answer many questions. <laughs> <laughs> you said you I'm going to bring a slightly broader brush to this. Um, human, some human beings always wanted to make a mark. So a few moments go back. Humans made marks. Of, a wall is a surface. You made marks whether it's a cave wall, a wall in Pompeii, 
awarded Mussolini's Rome. I mean, the history of that sense, the history of graffiti goes back as far as human beings. The reason we're sitting here is a specific thing that happened within my lifetime. Um, at a particular moment, a great many artists felt separately, often working in different disciplines, they needed to get out of the system. They need to get out of the gallery system, they need to get away from dealers, from collectors, from museums. And not all of them are, it happens that the street artists, especially the street of Rome, they're the, they're the ones that imprinted it. When I talk about graffiti, those people I'm talking about. But it's true of land artists, it's true of Robert Smith and Spiral Jetty, it's true of Les Levine putting up billboards. A lot of artists just wanted to get the hell out. Some people did it because they hated it for New dealers. Dennis Oppenheim became a public artist. Uh, graffiti, however, is what we hear about. That has a specific history and um, it's become incredibly rich. In my, I, I would say my, in my parents' and grandparents' day, ordinary people, okay, rich people made the grand tour in Europe and went to look at the paintings in Rome or something. Most people, the only time they ever saw pictures was in houses of worship. Now the whole planet has become a kinetic optic event. But it began, a lot of it began right here in New York, and this is why we're sitting here. Carlo, can you hit me with that question again? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Linus, uh, for you, I mean, I'm just curious, uh, it's really about this, what inspired you to work with the street, the urban canvas, what you saw, but also when you started. Were you doing stuff on the street before we went to school? Right, definitely. Um, so I should point out that I've known David for 40 years, and Chris not much less than that. Um, we were at Music and Art High School at various times. Uh, David sensibly dropped out. Chris dropped out of State University of Purchase, where I was. Um, the entire time. Um, so we're all like New York City kind of mischief kids, I would say. And that kind of led to <laughs> that kind of led to wanting to usurp the really staid, still in the seventies kind of gallery system in the early eighties. As a young artist there weren't much to do with your art aside from say go to art students league and bring that work home and put it against the wall or go to art school draw in class and put it against the wall when you got home so this started to infuriate me early on in art school because the faculty was all tenured and totally not savvy to the new york art scene and i felt like i wasn't learning anything so meanwhile, my friends uh, were actively getting into having their work seen on the street. And I thought that was incredible. And of course, if you were in a, a teenager in any part of the 1970s, you were aware of like the Samoisms downtown. And could see that around. So I started to think about street art. and. I was still in touch with these guys, Chris and David. Um, you had a loft on what, 19th Street on the west side? Yeah, whatever. So I'd go over there and see Chris working. And it wasn't like he was doing this for an art class. He was a straight up young artist doing his thing for art for art's sake with existential abandon. And I thought that was pretty intriguing. So. Because of Al and because of Avant forming, <clears throat> on top of all the graffiti I saw going to high school on the subway, which was, you get on the, the one train at 8 in the morning, and it's packed, and your face is jammed up, and you're like, you know, attuned to the, the calligraphy in, in the subway, and you're forced eye to eye with, like, a, a Fat Five Freddy from Futurita or Block or whoever. And it's just like so jarring and amazing. And then you get to school and you know, you're in this dumb art class and you're still thinking about what happened on the train. Anyway, so those manifold influences 
made me think, this is cool, I want to do this shit. And I went up to uh, one of the members of AWA and said, hey, can I be in the group? I want to paint. I thought I'd be a painter. I was already kind of doing abstract stuff. And he said, no. So uh, <laughs> rather than approach another member of AWA who might be more inclusive, I sort of took no for no and um, thought, well, fuck, they don't want me to do it. What could I do on the street? And one of the few things I learned at SUNY Purchase was welding. They had a really good metal shop. So I was already doing that, and I said, well, when I, and then I thought, hmm, something with metal. And I remember as a kid, I used to walk to school and burn up extra energy climbing the no parking signpost, <laughs> which are the, these channel irons with perforated holes in them. So I would like jam my foot and kind of climb up to the top like eight or nine feet. And uh, I remember, wow, I, what about these signs? They have holes in them. Maybe I could attach stuff to the holes. So I measured the holes on the street and brought them back to the studio and made some constructions. And first I put them up around the SUNY College campus, about 25 of them. And uh, I promptly got a letter from <laughs> security and I went through the dean of the art school saying I'd be fine if I left them up $25 a piece. So I said, okay, this isn't hospitable. So I took them down to the Lower East Side in Soho and the Upper West Side where I still live and put them up around. And uh, they had bolts that you could never get them off. Yeah, that was the thing. You, you put the nut through and put the bolt on and then whack it with a hammer and um, they weren't going to unscrew it, that's for sure. So you had to pry them off. So, so yeah, that's how, that was the motivation to what I ended up doing. And actually, a, a second chapter to try to join Avant, now that I had my own genre, which I was calling 3D Graffiti, it, approached the same member again and said, how about I join Avant and sign my metal sculptures Avant? And he was like, no. <laughs> so, so then I was, I was like debating what to sign them. Eventually I signed some Linus, I signed some La Font Terrible, I signed some the art terrorist. And uh, then I didn't sign others, became anonymous. And more in recent years, the graffiti vandal squad. <clears throat> so that's that was my uh, my evolution. I think it's great you brought up Les Levine. Uh, you did, sorry. Yeah, yeah that was uh, that's killer because those billboards are great and. I think it's a big difference, though, when you talk about uncommissioned public art versus people who are renting spaces. So I think we can acknowledge there's a DIY aspect. Maybe it was out of poverty, or maybe it was out of the urgency of the moment. So that that's a nice difference to think about. And then I guess uh, Lauren, what uh, what would you um, pray? I just want to say something about that because that's like really deep in the history and kind of a mythological figure. But I will, I. I the person I trust most uh, on this was uh, uh, Frisellus Days, who told me he saw like an old African la uh, American lady, right, you know, scratching that like in Times Square, like back when he was a kid. So we think it was like somebody who was doing it for Jesus. Uh, so yeah, yeah. yeah. You, have a, you, got, you have no uh, praise, no, yeah, That sounds right, though, right? The story's been told by a few people. That yeah. 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 We believe the best kitchen. I am Spartacus. Yeah. I think, uh, other than the fact that we just learned that between Al and Chris, it's everyone here is their fault to some degree. So thank you guys. But uh, I, I want to allow this uh, idea that. Uh, there are hoodlums and mark makers and all sorts of different types, but there is a, uh, one group of people that's been most uh, uh, attracted to graffiti and to these other um, aspects of street art 
right now it's muralism, uh, but there's also the intervention thing. And those are basically artists. And so one of the things that uh, doesn't always make sense, it makes sense in the market, but not always in people's mind, is the difference between your studio practice and what you're doing on the street. And how does one sustain the other? And how do you, you know, not look cheesy when you go in a gallery? Because it's a very different game, right? Like, what's going to grab you on the street is going to be considerably different from uh, the kind of contemplative gaze of what you look at at a museum where you live with for 50 years in your apartment and stuff. So, uh, since I think uh, uh, we all, uh, all of you have this both bodies of work going on in the studio and the street to maybe talk about how they each inform each other and how one may satisfy something and the other one may satisfy something else. Does that make any sense? All right, should we just kind of pass it down the same way? Oh, I got to Thank you so much first. <laughs> Do I want to mix it up? Do you want to mix it up? Why don't yeah, we start, let's, let's start all the way to the other end. Let's go backwards. Back, back to you, Lance. What do you want to get like, you know what, I also, I wanted to say it because uh, we're really lucky, not just with everyone here, but we got a lot of really smart heads with a lot of experience in the room. So I want to open this up to a conversation like as soon as possible. So do what I do and just take a little notice about what you want to make comments about. And yeah, we have to get a little bit, we should really yeah. open it up because there's a lot exactly. of amateur yeah. historians here. Can I say something about that mention of Craig? Yeah, it brings up something really very relevant, which is the reason he's forgotten is very simple. Norman Mailer in 1973 wrote a famous essay, and also a book called The, the Soul of Graffiti. The he of started graffiti. with a list of names. Those names are all forgotten now because the internet has not happened. There, there was nothing online. It's, it's all gone. It's all gone. It's now, it's graffiti now, it's good. But the internet. It may be whitewashed the next day, but it's right. online forever, AGD. which is crucial. Yeah. So graffiti is kind of like abstract expressionism as far as the looseness and immediacy of it, or jazz music. Let's say the opposite of calligraphy in the sense of uh, the Japanese scroll painting or uh, just making letters with a pen, real tight and rigid. So when I do the stuff on the street, it's really fast and loose. And I don't care about it. If, it. if it gets ugly, I might add more to it until I get past disliking it. So just the difference of what I do on the street is much looser and less uptight and less calculated and more open to experimentation. In my abstract metal sculpture, I do a lot of different genres of things with uh, found metal, but I also paint in 2D in uh, abstract expressionist graffiti style, I call it, because I'm very influenced by the early 70s writers. And I shared a studio with Fat Flat Freddy and Futura in the mid-80s and saw it up close. So that's still in my mind on a, on a daily basis, how those forms go together, and <clears throat> what the possibilities of different combinations are. And that extends to the sculpture, but that's specifically a graffiti rather than a street art idea. So it, there's sort of different levels to it with different styles of 2 and 3D stuff that I make how that interplay happens. I did work on the street. But, you, know, but, but you notice a difference. You, come on, you, you do more studio visits than I do, and you're keeping track of the street. So we're talking about the difference in studio work so talk about, work. Yeah, talk about this difference from your critics with you. Come on, you know. <laughs> Don't be shy. Well, you know, so I look at Chris's work. I mean, is this studio work or street work? It's brilliant work. I, I did. What Linus has just said, there's a difference in quality between the old speed, quality. sorry, speed, uh, between the street work and the studio work. I'm sure that is the case. Um, 
LA too just told me that you know when he was when he was working with Keith Haring, I mean Keith he said Keith Haring was basically a studio artist who did very little real work. I mean he, did, he yeah. sometimes did stuff on the subway, but basically he was even then he was a studio artist working in a street situation. Um, huh. I need to think about that. Um, I'm sure you'll have something more to say. Now. Well, pass it on. Yeah. Yeah, I'll get a puzzle. Yeah. Well, um, I approached the whole street thing a little bit differently. I, I think that maybe at some point down the line we'll discuss this um, because I think the title of the show is The Birth of Street Art, and we're talking, and some people are talking about graffiti, some people are talking about street art, so I think maybe at some point we'd like to define those terms and see where they relate to what's going on here now. Um, <clears throat> as I said, because I was coming from a more um, classical view of art, uh, I did do some street art. And part of it was just in the, you were in the East Village and you started to see what was going on and it was kind of a, it was kind of a challenge, you know, that uh, you know, somebody throws this down and says, okay, man, you got it. <laughs> Could have been uh, Jean Michel, could have been Keith Haring, could have been Kenny Sharp, could have been the Albani guys, uh, Richard Hamilton, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, part of the thing for me was that you could be an artist and you can go home and you can work in the studio and you can be very comfortable and everything is nice and you have your little stack of paints and your palette table and the canvas on the wall and everything is nice. Suddenly you go out on the street and maybe you've got a can of paint or something, and people are walking up and down, and there are cops and cars and this and that, and suddenly it's like, go go do this. You find that you're in a whole different kind of a world. Um, one of my projects was that <clears throat> I was sort of looking at the spray paint people, and I'm going, gee, that's okay, that's okay. All right, but I always loved, like I said, I'm a classic painter, and so I love people like Rembrandt, Van Gogh, and those people, and I happen to work at a paint store. So I would uh, pick up the, uh, the tubes of paint that people would drop in the store, and something would pop open, and they would just gather these all up and throw them in a box in the back room. So I would sort of, like, before I'd go home, I'd sort of grab one or two of these, stick it in my pocket, and my little tag was, I would just take a tube of oil paint, and squirt out real paint. Oh, that was my tag. Yeah. And uh, go back a bit because because I wanted to try to say to these people, okay, yeah, this spray paint stuff, that's okay, but it's gonna fall apart. It's gonna flake off. It's this and that. And so it's like let's let's take this, but let's look at Rembrandt. Let's look at you know the master. We, maybe there's some way that we can sort of cross this over. Anyway. Um, so I went out and I did that, and at one point I made a mistake. I, was, I told myself, I'm not going to do this in the subways. One night I ended up waiting for an F train for like an hour and a half, and I got bored, and I pulled out my tube of paint, and I squirted this on, on a wall at the second end of the subway stop, and, and the train comes in, and I step through the door, and I'm waiting to go home, and <laughs> two arms reach through, grab me by the collar, pull me out, and I got busted, I got arrested, I spent the night in jail. And this was maybe two weeks after Michael Stewart had been killed by the cops at the maybe two, one or two stations two. from there. Uh, anyway, one of my other projects, because I, I appreciated street art, but I wanted to come at it from a little different attitude, from a different angle. I was also doing kind of a conceptual approach to it, so I had another project called E-Race, E-R-A-C-E, and I would, <laughs> I'm lucky I worked at the art supply store, so I got some big erasers and magic markers and things, and I would actually go out <clears throat> and I would see like Keith Haring would do the chalk drawings, and there were two or three other people who were doing chalk drawings. I would actually go out to these, on these black panels of paper, and I would erase the stuff. And I, would th I was thinking back that this is a cool reference to Robert Rauschenberg erasing the William de Kooning drawing back in 1953. And the great thing about it was somebody like Keith Haring or Kenny or some of these other people, they would run up there, they'd be, they'd be able to like draw this out in like 20 or 30 seconds. I have to go in there and I'd spend like 20 minutes erasing this thing. So I'd actually be in there and the cops would come by 
And they were like, what the hell are you doing? You know, you can't do that. I said, no, no, I'm, I'm just a good citizen trying to like restore order and cleanliness to the city. And they're like, these guys are going to be ahead of you. You're never going to catch up with them. I said, well, you know, I still want to be a good citizen and clean things up. And they would just say, no, suit yourself. So, and, and it was a hard job. And it was like, I'm thinking to myself, is this really, does this really count? I mean, nobody's going to notice this, and nobody did notice it, and I made the mistake of not documenting this. But, and this is one of the things about these people and this whole movement is that there's a lot of energy and a lot of time and planning, and you're going out and you're looking and you're chasing out places of where can I do this, where can I do this. It's not something that just happens instantaneously. It's, it's, there's a lot of you know, criminal intent, you know, there's a lot of thought and stuff going into this. Anyway, um, so for me, I think the most important part of the studio practice versus the street action was that kind of, it's almost like an adolescent male kind of like daring you to go out and do this and putting yourself out there and taking, taking the risk of getting busted, which I did. Here's the funny part. I had been painting and showing in New York for a couple years before then. I was totally ignored, totally ignored. Uh, so I get arrested, I get busted, and I was talking about Gabriel Breyer's the gallery. So a couple of days after I got out of jail, Leo Castelli had sent a couple of collectors by, you know, and they come in and they're looking around and going, oh, okay, I do we got anything interesting in the back room? They go in the back room, they're looking around, they see one of my pants, they go, well, that's kind of interesting. You know, who's that guy? And it's like, well, he's blah, 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 blah. I've never heard of him. So. And they're walking out, she goes, oh, but he was arrested. <laughs> and they go, what? And they sort of turn around and fall like, what do you mean he was arrested? Oh, no, he was arrested for graffiti. Go, really? Do you have any more of these things? What? Yes, of course, I have this. So, she sold three of these pieces to this guy, these, this couple. Anyway, within a period of a month, she had sold 15 pieces, scheduled me for my next one-man show, which sold out. And anyway, so that kind of is part of the whole thing of like, if you don't risk something, if you don't take that chance, if you don't put yourself out there, people are not going to take you seriously. Uh, uh, Lauren, I'm very happy you did have a <laughs> job at Utrecht because somehow I did get cheaper canvas every now and then. Um, but on your note about you know this cleaning up and your your your, your interaction with the cops uh, on the other side of things, I have a friend who's a, a dear friend who's from Germany. He won a Fulbright, came here and stayed forever, of course. He's, you know, and then he got his green card in the lottery. And he calls himself the de vandalizer now. Now, probably some people hate him, they love him, whatever. But what he's doing, he's gone. Now, I, I don't want to speak about the particulars right now. Uh, I want to say, like, street art has become so involved, and so many people are doing it. Now we have sticker art, right? right? Yeah. Now, well, we call it sticker art, but some of them are for locksmiths and for, you know, the most banal things possible. And this guy goes around scraping them off, gets busted by the cops, and he's like, well, I'm just picking them off, he's there. I'm just picking them off, you know. And he puts them on canvas, he's like Duchamp. He's using the new flood of, of ready-made information that's out there from all, you know, because it, it's, it's, like, it's like the digital era has brought us into uh, dyslexia or, or ADD for, for finishing a sentence. So, He's taking these things and repositioning them on canvas. And I, I think that's an interesting thing, but it's a side point. I think we have to look at Somebody what is street. Really angry at them. Yeah, of course. But what is street and why is there a difference? So um, that's what Carl asked. So, you know, I, I'm not really sure about that. I think it's individual. Everybody will have their own particular reason for why that will be different here and different there. But if, uh, like I think if you have a, um, if you look at the music industry also, right, the last big revolution, the sky is falling 
said all the record industry, you know, the, the gatekeepers who were speaking to this, you know, the very narrow uh, elite establishment of our world. And everybody wants to get out of that. Nobody wants to be part of that. So you change it and you do what you can. And I think today, everybody has so much more opportunity to actually do what they do on the street. But you have to be willing to sacrifice it. That's all there is. If, you know, if you're born with a silver spoon and you got a lot of money, you can go on the street and do amazing things, maybe, or if you're austerity measures and you have no other way to go to express yourself, you have extraordinary possibilities. And I think that's what's so dynamic about street art, and that's why you know, we might have influenced, we were influenced by those, and then we influenced others. Uh, we didn't just set a milestone, I think we set a millennium stone. You know, it, it, it's like if you have a bad idea, nobody's gonna follow you off a cliff, right? Nobody's gonna retweet you. If, if you have a good idea, and you're at the time and the moment where, as you said, there's this explosion, it's just, you know, it's a time, uh, what did Martin Luther King say? It's, a, it's an idea whose time has come, right? And it is just right then when everybody, and the, and the drugs were right, and New York was right, and the streets were decrepit, and you know, there's a lot of good graffiti, of course. And then, you know, the, the wild style just went crazy. I mean, yeah, these people were brilliant. But there was something missing for the, uh, for the fine artists. There was something missing for the poets. There was something missing for that. And it just kind of exploded then. And I think, for me, I don't make street art anymore, so uh, that's why I'm talking in general. Uh, we, we found our way through that, and we continued, and now we're making sculpture of Christopher. So, you know, we're just evolving artists, and that was one very big part of us. And it, it, if you get a venue, in the South of France, or you get a venue in Russia, or you get a venue in China, or you get a venue in you know whatever the gallery you're working with, there's always going to be even right in there. If you don't even go to the street, there's going to be influences and restraints that will tell you, like, I've got to just be myself and do this, or there are things that I have to look at. And the street, the wonderful thing about the street is, you've got to be a two-way street. It's not a one-way street, you know? And if Avant is dead, long live the avant-garde, you know? It's like that will always be a thing. There will always be a challenge, and there will always be a new way for artists to express themselves and move beyond the gatekeepers. And, 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 you know, yesterday's the shit, you know? It's like yesterday's goal is tomorrow something, so, but it's the artists who, give that value, who take the risks, who move it, the envelope forward. And I think that's that's been forever and always will be, so I hope. Oops, sorry. Hi. So as far as uh, the stuff I do in my studio, it's I use a lot of the elements of a lot, but not only the elements that, that I that I, have, that I have incorporated in my street art and my graffiti. And I kind of have to make a distinction because my graffiti, it, although it's all a, a lot, most of it is text oriented, it's messages that I do. Um, one, the same has always been, you know, just the graffiti. It's done in a marker or a can of spray paint and it's strictly words, just expressing a, a, a uh, sentiment or whatever. The, the signage I do is a little more poetic. So there's a little, it's a little loftier, it's a little more ambitious. I use uh, wet paint signs to, and subway icons to make, uh, like I use that as a constrained alphabet. So my messages only contain 22 characters and I have to work within those constraints. So it's a po poetic and, and more artistic process and reposting the signs. Anyway, I use both those elements in my studio work, but um, and it's much more controlled, and it's it's a it's an item that one can take with them when they, you know they can take it off the wall and, and take it home, and it's a, a, a 
a movable object. The graffiti, the, the act of graffiti, and I still am actively, I've, I've been writing graffiti for 47 years, and I still do it, and it's hard to shake it. And it's an act of defiance. And, yeah, yeah. Well, whatever. Anyway, yeah, well, they, have, they, they, got my, they probably have my phone number by now. But, but they, anyway, it's an act of defiance. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a recertification, a daily recertification of my license to, to, to do this stuff. Because I've been doing, I, I firmly believe if you, if you call yourself a street artist, you need to do art in the street. And the, the idea of me having a permit it's, it's nice and everything, but, but I don't need a permit because either way, if I want to put something up, it's going to go up, believe me. And it has and it does and it, it could, will continue to do that. So that's, to me, you know, a, a very important factor is uh, as a graffiti artist, if you, if you don't take a risk, then it's just not, it's, you're not really down with the guys. You know? I mean, we've been doing this for a long time and, and we continue to do it. and. It's you know it's it's not it's not everybody's cut out for it. I I hear like this whole new new wave of, of, of people that call themselves street artists and they sound you know it's like it's like it's like a new it's like in this if, if you want to compare it to like uh, the hippies in, like store bought hippies in the seventies that are you know who's got the nicest fry boots that's what the new school of, of uh, street artists kind of some of them sort of remind me of it's like. You know, you bought all this accoutrement, but you don't really, you never really rolled in the dirt. So it's, it's a different mentality, especially for someone like myself who's been doing this since 1971. You know, it's just a long time. So it's very different, you know, studio to the attitude. Even though it may be a similar element, it's the attitude that's, that's of actually doing a, 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 it's an act of defiance, partially. It's, it's because I, I want to say that I, I want to express that sentiment, and it's important to me to do it in a public space where others can see it. And the studio, once again, is a much more controlled environment. Okay, thanks for giving me a second to collect my thoughts. He's got uh, four pages of notes. This my no, this page and a half. <coughs> First, I want to, um, I think it was Lauren mentioned. Yeah, I, I do want to say that, um, Avant was a fairly open group. There were uh, several females involved. Uh, the two I can think of offhand are both really quite successful in the art business right now, and I don't think they want to be affiliated with street art. So I'm not going to say their names, but it was not an exclusively white male agenda. Uh, other notes I've made here, listening to my friends speak, was uh, I remember Rene Ricard, was the, the late Rene Ricard, he died, I, I guess about a year and a half ago. I, I remember him cornering me in front of our first or second gallery exhibition and to, not recognizing me and saying to a bunch of other people who were there that I was the enemy because uh, we represented the studio artists going into the, taking the work into the street rather than vice versa. The, 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 the street kids, if, if, uh, assumingly, going into the galleries, whereas we weren't really in the galleries, but it was a studio aesthetic, I guess, taking into the street. So, some of the, 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 the kids who we grew up with did have the legitimate gripe that we were kind of jumping into their limelight. Yeah, all right. So uh, I'll make a couple of notes. Um, Which kids? kids? I'm not going to name anybody, man, but you know, they had, you know who the big stars were. The people just, from before. The late, you know, the graffiti guys who were really hitting it big. The name of them. Um, we, we had a, a lot of, the, you know what, forget my notes, that, that's about what I wanted to say. <laughs> okay. Uh, I kind of want to open it up for the audience, maybe I should say a few things. Yeah. Um, let's see where I have my thing. I mean, I, I know that 
Oh, you want to say something? Well, what I think would be an interesting point for you maybe to, to clarify a little bit, we're talking about the difference between street art and graffiti art, but also um, you curated a show a couple of years ago called uh, Detourmont. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so that and was it. So okay. maybe some of the historical background, right. because we're talking about the birth of street art, right. and so it'd be kind of right. So there's a uh, the there's a lot of things uh, people have own their histories, and then there's this other longer story going on, which is called history. I think uh, one of the mistakes that my generation made is as writers trying to support graffiti is that we were so struck by how new it was. It made it was sort of like when a new kind of music comes out and all of a sudden every record in your collection seemed really arcane and obsolete. It kind of did that to a lot of art history. And so we made a mistake of, of saying, oh, well, this is now and everything before is kind of passe and irrelevant and real art was good that way because you were, you were kind of reminding us that actually this, this at least Western language of artists communicating has been, you know, over centuries and cultures and at the moment has been going on for a, a mighty few centuries now. So we kind of blew that, but there is, of course, a longer history. So one difference we can say, well, if we just want to get to what graffiti is, okay? So uh, a lot of people want to throw in like cave painting or petroglyphs or, or this kind of uh, something hardwired into us like religion is that we need to make a mark um, and we fetishize that mark, uh, the most famous photo of the moon landing is actually the footprint on the moon. We're obsessed with our mark making abilities. But graffiti is actually not a Latin term, it's an Italianate, and it comes from the discovery of Pompeii. So when they discovered Pompeii and they saw like in situ what happens uh, if you just arrest any given place at any given time, you will see that there was a lot of mark making going on. So that's how we did it and it kind of uh, we translate to kind of the scratching of a mark. Um, what we can say about graffiti versus something like petroglyphs or the paintings at Lascaux, which we don't really know their meaning. We don't know if they're historical, like we killed three buffaloes that day, if they were magical thinking. We really don't know. We don't know why people did them. Uh, graffiti uh, is tied to language. That's why a lot of people talk about Greek, or ancient Greece and ancient Italy. It's actually with the written language, so it is word-based. Uh, street art, uh, people have been doing work in public places for a, a long time, as long as we've had the sense of public space, and so as long as we've had streets and cities and things like that, and it, I bring up, you know, going back many centuries, people who really actually had active bodies of work addressing urban space. Uh, what we can talk about for this moment, this kind of early 80s moment, I think, is that you had a whole bunch of visual artists in New York, the Kenny Sharp, Keith Haring types, people like that, who, uh, or, but also like Barbara Kruger and Jenny Holzer and all sorts of people with real studio practices saw what was going on in the subway and you couldn't help but get intoxicated by that. So a lot of people were um, kind of driven outside the studio to address public space and none of them wanted to, you know, and unfortunately it was all called graffiti. Uh, and it was always like this kind of misrepresentation, but if you talk to, to Herring or any of those people, they're like, no, I'm not a graffiti artist, I understand the skills and the risks involved in that, but that's really like a, a street art moment, but it pre-exists. So anyway, that's just me, uh, because I have to be a historian more often than I want to be. Uh, I just clarify a few things, but I have questions to ask you, but I don't want to be a greedy bastard. Should we allow other people to ask questions? Does anyone want to say anything before it turns into the scrum? I okay. don't. Go back okay. Forward. Anthony, you want to say something else? Um, I had a talk with somebody who's been nameless, Scott Borowski, who's sitting here. Um, he told me a while ago that. Um, He'd heard uh, from a well-known art worlder that um, at the time when street art was coming into bloom, that they were told by a serious gallery or who it was. Um, oh, sorry, we got them. We got we got Keith Haring, we got Jean Michel Basquiat, we got Kenya Sharp. That's all we need. There's no more room. Now I used to think that was 
typical conspiratorial nonsense. And I've now decided it's pretty much true. And what's happened, another reason I think we're sitting here, is that with the immediate, immediately consequential upon the death of Richard Hamilton and the explosion in his reputation and the extraordinary show of Ranel Z, um, there's a, a big melting in the art world now. A uh, melt, a big melt in the hierarchies. A lot of unrecognized talent is coming back to the fore. And there's yet another reason for it, not just a commercial reason. Way back uh, in the old days, Dupin Fay and Picasso, to some extent, tapped out cyber art. They felt the art world become innovated. They found all the energy in outside art. And through Brissai graffiti, because Brissai was friends with both of them, and he okay. made a book in the late 50s of the kids scratching graffiti in the walls of Paris. So mm. they were okay. very aware of graffiti. Go ahead. Yeah. Also, you have Paul Clay accessing children's art. What we're doing now is the art world, which is in a very innovative state. A lot of what, I, I guess, on before me, it's already boring work. There's lots of very well made. It's not exactly kids, it's not exactly, but it's kind of academic. We're in the salon era for much of the art world. Beautifully made, about as radical as Mickey Mouse. And graffiti suddenly has become a great source of energy, which is why we're all here. Okay, let's, uh, let's open it up. Thanks for having me. Thank you you want to uh, say something there, John? Okay. Uh, it's been a lot of uh, chair, but I also want to <coughs> ask a couple questions. First of all, I want to say, you know, I'm on this side over here, but in 1988, besides Samuel, Hamilton, and Harry, there was one street artist who had been written up in most of the major art magazines and the Times. So, how do you do? Anyway, uh, I have a question uh, for Chris. Um, I've heard a different story about how Avant got started. And it's a great story. And now I get to tell it instead of you. About this artist who had a gallerist come to his studio to show him his work, to look at his work. And the gallerist said, oh, you do too many of them. Too many pieces. And that artist was so pissed off at what that gallerist said, went over to the gallery and plastered his work all over the front of the gallery. <laughs> You're not supposed to say that. I heard that was the beginning of a book. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's, that's a good story. Which sorry. gallery was that? I'm not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Alexander Milliken? I, uh, he that, no say? That's funny also because uh, Keith uh, famously had, you know, uh, a lot of really smart uh, heads in his ear telling him, yeah. What to do, and the first thing they said no, was, no, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't, uh, uh, they told him, like, just cut down on production. Uh, and for God's sake, stop signing every kid's jacket and black book. And, you know, stop giving this stuff away for free. If you make 10, for, uh, 10 paintings for a show in Asia, uh, 20 paintings for two shows in Europe, and maybe 20 paintings for two shows in the States, that's really prolific, and you really can't make any more. And his response was to open up the pop shop. So I think one of the things we can talk about, the street versus the studio, and artists are incredibly generous. They're the ones who give their work all the time for every benefit, undersell the value of their work, and they're really good that way. But we have to talk about the people who work in public space, especially without commission and without permission, that what they're doing is an act of incredible generosity for our culture, and it's not all about place making and selling that. That loft. The, the last poets you're familiar with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't Famously, mind. there's a line that says, um, "We were true artists, not afraid to give too much." Yeah. And, and that, that was part of that spirit of. of they were totally the radical. Sixties through the eighties. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you have something, go ahead. You have to give it. And this is a question for Al. You know, Shoot. Al. Al was a writer before street art existed. And that was 10 years. That was 10 years, 1971. Almost 10 years before street art as a movement really happened. And, uh, and then you were hanging out with Jean Michel, and Samo came out, and Jean Michel 
questions. They kind of took the flag and ran. Yeah, I mean, but what I want to know <laughs> is there's another street artist, no, no, excuse me, another graffiti artist, a writer, early on, I think he was 14 years old or something, that had something to do with it. With? Flint. Oh, Flint, yeah, I've always credited Flint for his format. Well, I don't think many people know well, Flint, the story. Flint was, was one of the influences. I used the, the ellipsis, the dot, 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 and followed by a slogan. Uh, Slim, uh, Flint generally wrote um, like movie t uh, titles or, or something from like a pop culture. It wasn't so much a message, you know, a, a provocative message. But I did use the, the temp his template, and I also used Prey as a as a uh, inspiration because Prey was planting this kind of like relig you know religious thing in, in your head, and we were just using. Manipulate using that, that sense of manipulation of like you know planting like this is some some sort of religious thing because it was quasi it was not that it was an actual religion but we were trying to sell it it was a a, a product that you didn't exist off. we were kind of like Madison Avenue guys but like fifteen and seventeen <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if people really realize like, it was a, 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 I like to call it a, a, an experiment in hype it really really came out of graffiti. Oh so yeah, I, I was a graffiti. Really Jean Michel was a part of the graffiti culture. That's, that's just that he, he wasn't a writer. I was the graffiti guy. Can I interject? That's kind of the theme of this whole uh, whatever we're doing here. Is that moment Dan when Dan Witz, 1979. All right, Dan's stuff was so photorealistic, and it was on such a small scale, and so rarefied. Uh, perhaps it was so effective that I never noticed it. Did you? you saw those little birds? birds. You saw them? Did you see them? How many birds? Like a dozen? There's a lot. Yeah, uh, John Fechner. There's a lot of really important people in this history. Fechner was specifically uh, textual. Yes. All right, that, that's okay. the kind of the whole point where we can all get up and just like, what are the dividing lines? And, like, yeah. Uh -oh. Actually, uh, uh, well, repetition, uh, repetition on the street will give you a certain amount of uh, exposure or fame, but if you have credibility, but if you really are using the street in a way that you cannot in the studio or will not in the studios, when you're on the street, you you, you know you see a wall and it's like, or uh, I did the first bus stops. Uh, I brought that to Chris. We brought it amongst each other. We said, do we have a lock clipper? Yes, we do. And they had padlocks in those days. Now they have, and people are doing that now. They're ripping out the Christian oh, posters, geez. putting in their own stuff. But it's just there's a great the sculptor who actually makes the keys. He sends to all the yeah, artists in all the different yeah, cities. Yeah, yeah, he's a friend right, of mine. Yeah, he's a but, really good sculptor. It's a beautiful, endless, limited edition of little keys he yeah. makes for everyone. But for us, it was breaking and entering. No, it's no totally passing the key. And, and so, but the thing is, the street is always going to bring you new opportunities, new ideas, and everybody's going to have a new take on it and a way to go. And then, when you seize on that, you know, it's always nice that, you know, it, 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 it could be, it, it, could, it could just fail, you know. I mean, we learned from that. Hopefully you can film the studio still. So. We could be arrested. There's a particular joy in, in taking the work directly to the public. And the art world is a very rarefied place. It can be pretty snobby. And there's really a joy in um, a direct interaction with the public who you might not um, otherwise have any clue with. I've had people ask me, um, how much do I have to pay to get into an art exhibition or, or things like that? And, yeah, sure, I want to make money and. I got to eat, but I don't want to sound too corny, but yet there is some joy in it. Have you ever told a joke and you've heard it 20 years later, told in another country, and it was your joke? <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be like no, the same. I'm saying that there's, there's, some there's things, a joy in it. Yeah. Okay. Some things say. Do we safe. want to, are there any more questions? Otherwise, we can keep going. Okay, good. That one's all good. No, no desperate questions. Uh, well, I think we could uh, pursue a little bit of because uh, Chris is so wound tight on this stuff. 
but a little bit of this uh, distinction between uh, this generation distinction between graffiti and street or something like that is this uh, this is uh, between street art and graffiti is yeah this? okay uh, I think Al's such a beautiful bridge character do you want to like break it down for us I didn't think he was really the fulcrum yeah well one thing is for sure is that I mean First of all, the, the, like, the, like I spoke before, the, the, the uh, kids that were between 9 and 14 were not generally uh, art-educated kids that were doing graffiti. And when uh, street art, per se, uh, show, starts to, to show up, it's, it's pretty much a more academically, um, a more educated, more uh, stronger art background community that, that was pursuing this form. So it's, in that sense, it was a different community. It wasn't kids from the hood that are, you know. Can I, can I just bring in one thing there? Maybe you can compare it to your experiences. Uh, one of the things that people have looked at uh, uh, kind of re in retrospect is that the rise of, of this kind of uh, subculture and culture uh, in urban youth coincides with the defunding of arts programs in schools. That basically all the kids actually were, you know, the, the public school system actually had, through the mid 60s, pretty healthy art departments. And then uh, they kind of took that all away in austerity measures and graffiti kind of blew up. Does this ex uh, relate to your experience? Um, I, I don't have an actual experience to compare that to, but I can see the, the, the relevance of that. Absolutely. No doubt. But also, urban blight and, and the fact that New York was a shambles <coughs> during the, the period where graffiti culture excelled and became, I mean, things were, we covered the city, we covered the city. And there was a lot of um, shamble, like, yeah, the city was you know, tore up, I mean, it was free fall. And it's the end of air, uh, it was the Abraham Beam like, period. And, and, but especially the time we get to, like, the masterworks on the cars and stuff like that, beyond tech. It was sort of like we were living in a black and white world and graffiti made it technical. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I think that's perfect. It made it technical. It made it graffiti technical. wasn't technical. Yeah. Right? It's it's like, like, it's like, 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 I still see a black and white. It's like I don't you know, need to see that rat in color. I know how it looks against the sidewalk. <laughs> there are definite rules about what is decent and what isn't. When you, I just wanted to define, when you said cars, you're talking about train cars. Yeah. Like, there are, people might think it's all vandalism, but there are, you don't go and bomb a, um, a brand new house or, or um, uh, somebody's personal car. There are definite, it, it's a, a tacit laws about what is decent and what isn't, you know? It's the body politic, so for the same reason why it's taboo to tattoo on your face, it's not considered uh, cool to bomb a house of worship. Yeah. But those are somebody's cool. Yeah, it's like they have. If somebody's <laughs> people. If anybody, it should be people of dogma. People of dogma. dogma. Houses of worship uh, who exclude. Uh, the street is, no, I mean, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll take anybody on. Um, the street is about being open. It is. It is our public domain. Thank you. It's a public domain. You know, this was New Amsterdam. It was Leiden uh, University in 1600 to 1670 when New York got its character, got its flavor. Everyone else was at war in Europe, and Dutch were like, you know, let's, you know, we're, we're sort of thinking about reason and other things, and you know. I was staying out of war anyway for, for the time being, but the thing is, the street is a democratic, it's an open source, and some people realize that, the graffiti artists realize that, the, the, the countless people who came before, who have done great things, are always going to be, you know, a milestone along that way, and everybody gets influenced along the way, and I think what happens is, if, if you have to go up against religion, yeah, that's the one thing that doesn't change. So, you know, kill me later, kill me now. All I can say is the street is open, it's alive. But when it comes to, if you're gonna put something on a religious uh, thing, I got no problem with that. 
but that's just my personal opinion. And some of the oldest graffiti we have is from places yes. like the Vatican. Because it's, 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 it's a source of sites one of our worst can see centuries in, 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 in civilization. Lord, yes. Well, so I brought up a couple of issues that I think are kind of important. As I said, I'm an amateur historian. I love this kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> And I actually, I posted the invitation on Facebook, and I've had a couple of people that have posted things. You actually addressed a couple of them, Chris. Somebody was saying, oh, it's very uh, male-oriented. There were no women or, you know, minorities. I'm saying, well, I, there were a lot of minority people. There might not have been a lot of women, but there were some people that were doing this who were women artists. And I said, Jane Holtzman what was one of them. Christy Rupp was another one. OK, another thing that I'm kind of. I met within our group of well, but it, and they're so freaking famous now. They yeah, I was going to say, it's not like they've been ignored. <laughs> um, the other thing I was wondering about is um, whether any of you were aware of kind of the uh, European heritage, because a lot of this stuff goes back to what people, like the situations in their national oh, okay. like, I forgot you were about asking me about that. that. Yeah, so uh, what people wrong. were doing in Europe. And uh, even before the situationists, you know, there were the affishists, the the poster artist in, in Paris after World War II. So in a certain way, it's important to try to establish your particular um, reputation, your particular vision as a kind of a unique uh, thing for your time and your place. On the other hand, it's also important, I think, to kind of recognize that whenever you have culture, it's always something growing out of something else. And part of the, the value of, of this kind of culture is that it is a legacy, it is tied to history, it is tied to the past. So I was wondering, um, were any of you kind of like familiar with some of this stuff that's going Aware of the fascist stuff in the 30s? Well, the situation is that that would be the best example. You know, the kind yeah, of trick tri tri things and, and going out and like altering signs a little bit. So you would walk by and you just go, oh, it's the same sign that I said, I stick with any stuff, and you go, Hold it, no, somebody changed a letter or a this or that, and suddenly it changes the entire meaning of the sign. But there are a lot of things going on. Let me do that. And then I'm going to make people ask questions. Uh, Megan, so uh, the situationists are really important in this history. Uh, yes. Uh, the, the biggest body of work we know from May 68, which was a student revolts in Paris. Uh, where they shut down the city and they changed the culture substantially. Uh, more successful than the Columbia 68 student revolts or a lot of the stuff which happened in America because all that stuff happened three months after Martin Luther King got killed. So it wasn't quite focused in the same way. But the, they did beautifully provocative uh, graffitis on the street which would say like, underneath the pavement, the beach, or beauty is in the streets. They also had Atelier Populaire, which was really important for the poster art movement. And these were free posters of basically, you know, rise and resist posters, similar to what Emory Douglas was doing for the Black Panther Party in Oakland. Um, and then uh, Detourment is something which I, I maybe I just want to bring it up a bit because that was a strategy they had, which literally means like to alter a sign. And uh, I think we can talk about this kind of beautiful emptiness in, in New York, the gutted city after the white flight, the decrepit city, uh, and how that was a great canvas or a great kind of fertile uh, cesspool for things to grow. But I think a lot of what uh, kids now who address public space might be dealing with is this uh, privatization and co-option in public space, where we won the war on graffiti to live in branded subway cars the nicest uh, place to sit in the park is where you can have an umbrella and a table and order a $5 espresso or whatever. We've done a lot of these things where we've compromised public space. And a lot of that's with advertising. And I think a lot of kids are responding to it. So something like Detournement sticks out as something because that's kind of what, you know, you're talking about uh, hijacking bus stop things, you know, yeah. which is, where Cause and, and Espo and people like that a generation later really found their audience. So, uh, found they, remember, remember the Billboard Liberation? Yeah, Billboard Liberation Front, 74, 75, San Francisco. They're, they're doing 
you know, really radical we, alterations of the world. grew out of the situation. I, I heard that in the suicide club is what they grew out of. They're, it's a little different. Suicide suicide. Suicide. They were called the suicide club. The situation has abolished themselves worldwide, except in San Francisco. Essentially, Burning Man has been out yeah, but was one of the founders of the World Liberation Front did start that stupid party in the, the desert. Can I just talk to you? Uh, Christopher told me, because we're living near the BQD, and he told me that there, there are no more billboards allowed now. On, on, uh, what's going to happen with that? Uh, I don't know. No, it's a, it's a soft question. It's mm -hmm. only, I have heard since my living in Europe now, I have 28 years in Europe, 28 years in Germany, and um, I have just learned that there are billboards that are being banned on the BQD or something like that. Is that true? They're, they're that's all banned. Advertisement. advertisement. So what's going to happen with those things? But that's a, that's just a side question. Let's not get side. <laughs> I better. I want to ask you. Ask a question. Uh, question. Uh, okay, go ahead. Um, anyone else? So I'm just curious. Right. The graffiti was all over the place, all over the boroughs, Manhattan. So, without a doubt, graffiti. Without a doubt, street art was done by. Hundreds of artists was concentrated in the East Village between Avenues A and Avenues D. So there was a kind of unlawlessness in that area because of all the heroin, weapons, etc., abandoned buildings, buildings taken over by junkies, by artists, etc. So I always look at that place and that time as kind of the reason. I mean, I did pieces between 3 and 5 o'clock in the morning that took two hours to do, and they were up to 8 to 10 feet high. And I did them in the abandoned building, on the outside of the abandoned buildings, on Avenue C, in an area where there was only people out doing heroin sales and, and carrying around televisions on their shoulders at that time. Very, very dangerous. Yeah. But I was I was able to do it there. You could have done it anywhere else in the city. So the significance yeah, okay. of the East Village in terms of street art movement, that's well, I mean, I think we all have a way of uh, overly focusing on the time when we were young and really engaged. Uh, I think Anthony could tell you that there was a lot of really interesting stuff predating that in out of okay. Soho, like Charles Simmons or Gordon Mataclaw. Okay. Yeah, everything multiplied by numbers. Any, anyone else? You couldn't find a service in the East Village to paint on after 1988. <laughs> everything was filled up. Walls, ground, everything. I mean, that was the birth of the street art movement right there. And people from all different countries that arrived in that area at that time did similar things in different ways. And that all happened at the same time. And the show at the Avenue B Gallery, uh, the show at the Ross from Life was where they all got gathered. And that's where you could find, if you take that roster, you could find the people that were recognized because of the amount of work that they had done. Isn't there always a level of saturation that turns into a level of fracture, fracture that, that, you know, it's like if you get one answer, you have five new questions. Uh, and, and it just, you, you know, just that, keeps... Brooklyn's keeps well colonized right now. Did you, did you have some other question back there? Yeah, so there's like a physical symbol that like really is for me, so like an action versus a verb, right? So like when you see tele, like sneakers over telephone lines, what street does that, do you know what I mean? Like that's a physical act of the a verb, like this street's a, you know, for drugs. But like with graffiti, it just goes everywhere. So like what, like, an action versus a verb. Yeah, that's a, that's a really smart way to put it. I, I, um, Martha Cooper, who uh, many of you may know, she's kind of one of the great documenters of this whole movement. From when she worked with Henry Chalfant and did Subway Art, but then it's still like climbing fences in her 80s. Uh, she, yeah, she still lives here. She's not 80. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think so, like 81 now. Sorry, Martha. Just turn that camera off. Uh, but uh, she always said graffiti was an act. And I always thought that was really good because this was also like back at a time when we would see graffiti on canvases at the Fun Gallery or something like that. And I think it was a mistake. At that time, it was natural because graffiti 
had gone through wild style and all these other permutations and it had been like kind of there were all these style masters and so we started to read graffiti as a style but I do like that 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 idea is yeah it's like an act right we, is can we get consensus on that Absolutely. do I have an amen amen oh, yeah. 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 it's always about taking something one step forward I mean or then really it's, it's an act, you know, like, but it's, it's, my it's, kid's it's out physical. falling today, he's it's not sitting physical act. Like, you can't do it, I mean, it's more than physical. It's not a two-dimensional thing, it's, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's an act. It's well, yeah, you, you, you bring up, like, um, uh, you know, the, the volcano and, like, uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs and stuff like that. It's a physical act, that's what all comes down to. Right? Which well, hopefully, well, not, all way, but, not, not all the way there's thought, obviously. One, but which hopefully turns into. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. About, the sneakers on the, about the sneakers hanging out, that didn't always mean there were drugs in it. That was just a thing that, you know, yeah. it, was yeah. it was like, you know, all the, all the fellows from the corner would throw their sneakers out. And in terms of street art, very, you know, very early for the kind of modern movement of street art, because they're kind of intergenerational were these two cats out of Brooklyn called Skewville, do you know that show? And then one of the great things they do, and they still do it, is they do little, like taking plywood, little cut out of sneakers and painting sneakers and throwing these wood, yeah, you've seen that show, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. they make it's really good, good like, uh, yeah, they do lots of cool shit. And sneakers are something that's simple. Sometimes you look down and you can be like, oh, that kid looks too bad at Sometimes it's just some poor kid who's walking around the bus and some walk up. One of Christopher's, one of Christopher Hart's uh, paintings over there, uh, uh, historically, I think it's a 1982 or 81, I'm not sure. It has two of his sneaker prints from walking around on the painted floor of his studio, and, and two of his prints are actually part of the painting. Um, irrelevant. Go ahead. Like the footprints on the moon. Yeah. Yes. Like Do we have some more questions? Maybe people are also smart. You shouldn't just let us old artists talk. Anyone else? <laughs> okay, Michael, please. And I have again, I'm not directing this question to Al, but we have somebody who said on the panel. You're kind of part of the whole room between you know, what we identify as you know, so called graffiti and so so called street art. I don't see necessarily but I see kind of an interaction between both of these two kind of forces. And by street art, I'm talking about you know art that basically had an intention other than you know just to beautify the suburbs. You know what I mean? To write and blah blah blah. I mean all these things are related, obviously. But I think and. You know, my good friend Scott here, he has his own ideas about what the difference is there. But I just, maybe you should address this out. It's like, you know, how exactly do you see what happened like in the 70s when we were first writing into what later became a more kind of conceptual base? Everything was more. Everything was more was done on the street. You know, I think it was a kind of, you know, I, I hate to, to, to say that any, like, some one thing was like, what, you know, the first one. It's like, there's, there's always the, 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 this, this uh, discussion about um, cornbread in Philly and yeah. Taki 183, and there was no internet, and these guys are doing the same thing at the same time. Meanwhile, Hamilton came came out of Canada. He's doing that up in Canada, doing the, the body markings yeah, in Canada. Yeah. And all over Europe. There's no internet. Yeah, it's, the only internet we had was the, the number five train. They like went from the front. <laughs> so we saw somebody up in we, we South Hill. So what happens is it's zeitgeist, right? It's a general spirit that, that's out there. People are doing it. I think what graffiti did for this later generation of visual artists was, hey, you can just use public space, and why not, and aerosol and the rest of it, but I don't, because they were on a different page. Like I said, it was a much more academic uh, process, act, etc., etc. Uh, people that are trained artists, as opposed to somebody who's just writing his name and wants to write it more than the other guys. So, and, but I think it, what it did was it was the spirit of, hey, let's just do it out in public, was they, you know, graffiti planted that seed and, and made it, and made it out. 
Yeah. As much as you want to characterize uh, street art as maybe more academic, if there's a people's received background, right, right, right. can't we also say that graffiti was, by that point, become a very much a hermetic language? Yes. That, like, you kind of had to really, like, it was sort of like if you don't know heavy metal, it all sounds the same, or hip hop. Right. It was like you had to actually be able to read and understand what people were doing with the letters. Right. And then street art reapproached the public in much more democratic and accessible ways. Absolutely. No doubt. I, it's so beautiful. I, I love Carlo. He's so eloquent and articulate. But that's, that is definitely true um, because the graffiti artists did graffiti for other graffiti artists. And that's and it becomes a microcosmic little, you know, we're all doing this for ourselves. And there is a certain generosity of, of, of putting a, a, a picture that everyone understands. And that's right. there's no there's no uh, argument to that. Like, no matter how much your mother loves you, you know, at home is one thing. When you but when you go out and play on the streets, when you go out and you play on the streets, it's your terrain. You 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 shape. You, you, you explore and you shape, you can, you can do things that you're not allowed to do at home and nobody knows about it. Nope, we got a question and, about it. And that's always going to take it higher. And every generation has done that. <coughs> and it started with the writers, but every generation is going to do that. And like, think about what's going to happen in 20 years from now. You know, we got stickers now, right? What's the next form of expression for street art? It's actually murals right now, but the, oh, you know, course, but there's a sanction. Right I'm about to do a public sculpture on 34th and 1st Avenue, permanent, public, stainless steel sculpture. First time in my life, official, yeah. big ass thing. Let's go vandalize it. But <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I invite you cordially <laughs> to do so. <laughs> just, just don't it's dent it, room. you know. Yeah. All right. All right. Sorry, we had a question back there, please. Yeah. Um, So the question is about, uh, it's kind of about motive, which is uh, fundamental uh, to all this stuff. Did you want to say something, Linus? Why don't you answer that one? So it's now versus then is the other part of it. You heard that? You want to pass this down the line? Oh, Who wants it? Who wants it? What? I've gone all the way to the other end. Who wants it? So you sit on the end, we forget about you. Uh, that's a really good question. What's motivating the youth now as opposed to the early 80s? Well, there are a lot more youth now and who are aware of the idea of street art. We invented it. We, we, uh, the way I feel about putting scrap metal sculptures on no parking signs, that's my shit. I feel like I invented scratch DJing. That's, that's an important contribution in my mind to the culture. I'll pat myself on the back for that one. If kids these days can figure out some venue to do something <laughs> like that, I this totally applaud them. But, you know, there's so many trains leaving the station that you can pay on now, in fact, none. Well, what does it look like in 20 years? So, what is it? 20 years from now, what is street art? I don't even think about that, David. I'm just answering her question about what's up with the youth of today. And, They've got more more options to fall back on, more perspective on what started with yeah, us. Instagram. Can I, I think, but where are they going to go with it? Anthony, you talk on this. Anthony, you next. I can't answer David's no, question. I don't know. It's good. You did good. Like, let's hear from Anthony now, too. What's my what? Oh, no, I said you did amazing. Oh. But I think Anthony has I think it's one sentence. The elephant's in the room. Social media. Indeed. Oh, I'd like to ask, I'd like to add something to that question, that answer. Um, I don't think the press knew how to deal with street art. And so they did not follow it. They followed celebrity, they followed the money. But if they had, then street art now would be very different. Because what the press jumped on was three or four types of street art that were done. What they missed 
were people that were doing street art in trees. People that were carving into the sidewalk. That's people true. People that were <laughs> going up on, <laughs> on, on the billboards and just signing the billboards. Um, people who were uh, doing political stuff about Ronald Reagan. People who were writing numbers on the on the uh, cobblestones on uh, Avenue A. People that were doing uh, metal pieces high on street poles. Uh, people that were doing, uh, you know, all kinds of conceptual art. And, and though that art was a combination of art that came out of installation, bird work, uh, and, oops, and uh, other stuff at that time. Politics. So street art was much more sophisticated than the press has ever covered or led on. It was really a development of conceptual art. And if the young artists now had access to see what had been done then, the development of street art would have been completely different. And well, you, you, you might want to know your history uh, before you you know, take any action. You might want to know your Are history. You all who, but, uh, no, not that. you, not you personally. The, the, young, the younger generation might want to, and that's why we are invited here to do this, no, no, is no. To, to show a little bit of history to people who think that street art is part of the banks. Did you get your Personally, I think the kids should ignore us. Did, did you need another question? Yeah. I guess in response to that, I personally, the street art that I've seen is really political, and um, it is actually so many ways. And I guess more what I was wondering is if you feel like there's a universal theme about motivation for me, whether that's the critique of public versus space, do you feel like the motivations for the are evolving, or is it more like a continual process? Well, I mean, it's going to take that. Yeah, that's a long one. Uh, I mean, first of all, graffiti is probably more self-motivated in some ways than street art. It's part of the language. I think, yeah, I think you can answer that with, like, you'd have to ask each individual yeah. what their motivation is. Uh, oh, very you know how I asked you all like a question about because like the so first thing like you saw. So obviously, as a kid in New York, I saw lots of tags. I, I kind of was aware of that culture going on, but it would have been like in the early '70s. I have somebody uh, downtown, kind of my neighborhood, wrote USA out of NYC. This would be about '72, I think, and that was the first time I actually realized how subversive it was. Uh, you could be uh, just writing your name. So that changed my engagement with it. And then, of course, a lot of art stuff happened. But I think it's like six. And uh, we're supposed to have a band soon. Does anyone want to have any, any last licks, remarks? Or can we just call it quits and just keep on talking here? Great, great. Last remarks, great, great. Anyway, uh,